And now for the Monerotopia Price Report segment. GM body. Good morning, gentlemen. Body, what's up, man? How's my uh, how's my mic volume? It's good. It's good. You sound loud and clear. Cool. Yeah, I have a slightly new setup here, so uh, just want to make sure it's good. All right, let's get stuff. Yeah, no, I think it's yeah. I'm glad you guys are having this. I'm glad that we're having Monerotopia in Mexico City. I mean, obviously, because I, I live in Mexico, but New York is hella expensive. I don't like. I I'm from the states. I don't like going to the states. I hate crossing okay. the stupid border. I hate doing all their that whole dick dance. It's just it's too yeah. much. Gotta let it them do the like, anal probing, whatever. It feels like there's more <laughs> exactly. freedom in Mexico City these days than, than the U.S. <laughs> That's definitely been than New York. I don't know. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's, it's interesting super- how every like. Every geographic location has their different kinds of, like the different kinds of freedom that you can have. Like for example, it, it's hard to own a gun here in Mexico legally. Like they're everywhere; it's easy to get one. But like you really, if you get caught carrying, say, a nine millimeter around, like that's a pretty big crime. Like you could get in a lot of trouble just for carrying a nine millimeter. Um, you have like you have freedoms. Like your other types of freedoms are generally better here in Mexico. Like your personal freedom on a day to day basis. Um, but then like your ability to start a business is actually, it's much more difficult here in Mexico than, than a place mm-hmm. like the United States. Just like licensing so, and like things like that or. Yeah, anything? exactly. It's like, there's, there's mm-hmm. like a lot of things are sort of cartelized in, in a lot of ways, depends on the industry. Um, it can be hard. Yeah. Getting all the process, all the bureaucracy can be difficult. Starting like a local store, okay, like that's that can be easier. It just kind of depends. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just in general, like it. I, I've had friends that do business here in Mexico, and it's it it can be a little bit harder here because it's not as clear what you're supposed to do. Do you think? Do you think we can get Monero going in Mexico in a in a genuine way? I think it's one of the higher. Eh, let me let me rephrase this. Let me think about this. There's a a big contingent of anarchists that live here, anarchist libertarian people that live here that use Monero. Um, I even know Bitcoin maximalists that live here uh, or that that frequent here and they have Monero. Like they're not huge on it, but they have some. And, you know, if I said, hey, can I send you Monero? They'd accept it. So like it's probably one of our higher probability places to do it. But as far as the people go, like, yeah, I mean, you you can get people to use Monero here, hit and miss. in a more like in a larger context in a broader context it's it's hard to think that that like the masses are just going to adopt monero or any cryptocurrency without some kind of like big impetus or big reason to do it mm-hmm. uh florida tip 25 cents aaron day is doing yeman's work really living outside the fiat system looking forward to the chat we should ask about point of sale monero integration progress yeah definitely definitely thanks for the tip by the way guys use the tip uh, xmrchat.com just go there slash monero talk and you can very easily send a tip through there the link feed. in the description did um, that come through a different uh, format than youtube because i don't see it here on i don't see the comment here on youtube it comes through twitch yeah it's coming, oh, okay, you don't see it on the screen you don't where are you not seeing it oh no i mean on the monerotopia screen i was seeing it just not on on the oh, okay. On Not on the YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, so the other thing, Derek Bros, I mean, I ha- I spoke to him a couple of weeks ago. He's saying that in the area where he lives, he's trying to onboard people to Monero, it sounds like, in the town. Yeah, yeah. Lives. I mean, you you can definitely do it um, you know, one at a time through interpersonal relationships. It's it's totally doable. Um it's just harder to to see like in a in a bigger, broader context that, that would happen anytime soon. But you know, I mean, we're playing the long game, so it's it, over time, we could probably definitely get more and more people using it in a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Alma now is just saying New York is becoming the crypto capital of the U.S. Uh, all the major companies are here. There are plenty of people in the city that attend. You do deal with the hotel and sell pack. Yeah, trust me, man. I'm from New York. I live in New York. It is uh, maybe the crypto capital. It's the bit license capital of of. Of yeah, the the world. Say, they're they, they're the, the, the ones that invented that. crypto regulation. Monero has never been listed on the centralized exchange of Monero. But that being said, uh, I'm right with you, Alamo Jaguar, and I think we could make New York the Monero capital of the world. I do, I do think that's possible. You know, cash was always king in New York. 
It's completely legal to use Monero there. Uh, there are a lot of cash businesses in New York, a lot of people in New York that understand the importance of cash as a tool to transact peer to peer, where everything isn't, uh, you know, a complete, you know, uh, an event that's uh, on the radar of the government at all times. Uh, a lot of people appreciate that with cash and know that cash is going away. Um, we just need to get the word out. So yeah, by all means, let's try to grow it in New York, get it going. We saw XMR. Let me, let me just bring that up real quick. Um, Tux, you want to bring up, you know, we'll do it in the news. I don't want, I don't want to throw it off, but somebody recently, as you guys know, somebody posted that there was, that there were a grocery store in New York city that was accepting Monero. And I went and checked it out, but by all means they were. Uh, I'll be shopping there again. But then recently, somebody posted on XMR Bazaar. Um, they were selling tickets to an event, like an underground music event, and they used XMR Bazaar as a ticketing service to sell tickets for Monero. So there is hope for New York, I think, with Monero. I'll leave it at that. Paul, well, do you want to take away? Sure. Yes. So um, <clears throat> regarding price, you know, actual like price movements, we didn't have a whole lot happen over the past week. In fact, you can kind of see that Monero is, um, eh, let's just call it a funk. We're in a little funk right here at 150, um, basically just trending along these these standard, uh, sorry, the, the moving average lines um, in white. So we've actually, our price has been really, really stable, really flat, except for this little guy. I don't know what happened here, but there was this big spike up to 165 for like just a wick. Uh, at least on Kraken. You know, one thing that I wanted to do that I forgot to do is to take a look at the volume. So um, there's a reason why eh, I was really hoping that we would see more volume happening on Monero. Um, we'll get into it in, in a little bit, but uh, there's there's some developments with the Gox coins. There's developments. See, coins are, are moving, right? Bitcoins are moving right now across uh, different exchanges from different entities. So, um, yeah, at the moment, uh, Monero has been just remarkably flat in price. Um, so I guess that's okay. Like we're basically consolidating, it looks like at the, at the moving average levels, um, you know, where the rest of the market goes, probably Monero will also go, um, uh, with interesting moments where it doesn't follow, right? Like usually it follows, but then sometimes the market crashes and then Monero just stays stable. Um, so I, that's kind of an interesting dynamic that happens with Monero price at the moment. Yeah. I mean, we are just like dead flat right here in the middle. Uh, so that's kind of cool, I guess. Um, it, it's good to be stable, right? It, it means that you can have predictability over your business and over just over accepting Monero as a currency in general. One thing we haven't looked at for a while is the Monero market cap dominance. So <clears throat> it looks like we unfortunately, um, it looks like we unfortunately have this. Uh, we're just in this downward channel, and I don't know it. <laughs> It almost looks like we are irrevocably in this channel. It just seems like we're just stuck here, right? So this, perhaps this center trend line right here, we're basically just like following down that trend line. Although, you know, we haven't, we haven't dipped down here to this area. Um, so every time we take another dip, I think, hey, hopefully, you know, this could be the time that we make, we break out to the upside. Um, every, there's every reason for it to happen and, and there's every reason for it not to happen. So um, yeah, that's just what the market cap dominance looks like at the current moment. You would probably call this right here um, a little bit of resistance, right? That that bottoming spot that happened uh, in the bear market where Monero's dominance sort of bottomed for a long period of time. Um, and then we crashed below that. I guess that was with the delisting. And so now we're basically trying to, um, we're bumping up against that. And again, this is Monero dominance versus the entire cryptocurrency market cap. Um, so we've also got XMR versus BTC. And at the moment, yeah, things are also still just relatively flat. Crypto markets in general were pretty flat this past week. Um, so I guess kind of here in a holding pattern. I, I am happy that we could be at a holding pattern sort of at the top side of the, of the standard deviation range. Um, obviously, that's a lot better than, <laughs> than dumping to the downside. Um, it's also signals a little bit of strength, right? So on a, this is the eight-hour chart. So each candle represents an eight-hour time frame. Um, but you can see that we've kind of developed this this lower standard deviation on a shorter time frame, and we're we're sort of in between um, some bands there. So overall, in general, the fact that that price is staying here at the top side of the standard deviation bands that have been established over the past, say, like four to five months, um, that's usually a sign of strength, right? That's that means that that our price is consolidating at the upper, you know, at the top side at, at the higher levels there. Obviously, I think we still have quite a long ways to get back. 
um, to to places that well, let's go to the weekly here. We obviously have a, quite a long ways to get back to our our relative um, uh, ratio with Bitcoin. Where you know, I mean, really, we we should be at the at the zero zero five level. Um, on here, here at the right, I multiply this chart by I think it's a hundred because otherwise you would just have like point zero zero two um, or point zero zero two five. So just know that this is this chart has been adjusted by a factor of a hundred, um, and also the just due to the way that I the the wave magic script works, um, I kind of have to bump this chart up so that these lines don't get chopped off at the bottom. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, okay, we have the same deal with ETH going on. Actually, we we have a little bit better price action with ETH because ETH has not been performing super great uh, as of late. So um, Monero is is relatively doing um, a reasonably good job of, of making a little bit of a comeback from from earlier in the year. Now we're we're hanging out here in these lower standard deviation bands, which is a good sign. Um, <clears throat> you know, in ter in terms of the wave magic with Monero relative to other coins, in a lot of ways, I feel like. It's not quite as valid as I as I see other wave magic charts being. Monero's price gets jacked around with these weird um, fundamental events that we get hit with from nowhere, and it's a means of fucking with our price. And we all know the reasons for that. We don't need to to cover them again. Um, but we just see these crazy movements that happen in Monero, and they happen specifically because it's an attempt. Like we we continually get price attacks. So hopefully, with with Binance out of the picture, we're having fewer of the fractional reserve price attacks. But honestly, guys, I can't even promise you that because, um, you know, big changes have happened in the crypto ecosystem. For all we know, there are other big exchanges with lots of volume that people are on that are that's still doing fractional reserve. Um, we hope that Kraken is not doing that, but we really can't guarantee whether they are or they aren't. And Jesse Powell isn't in charge of Kraken anymore, if I understand correctly. Um, it's a different CEO. So um, speaking of Kraken, here here's all the price divergences relative to Kraken. Again, oscillating around the zero point. Nothing, nothing interesting with this chart right here. Um, okay, so yeah, let's let's talk about Bitcoin. Um, let's talk about Gox. Um, right now, people are getting paid back their Bitcoin. They're getting paid back their Bitcoin cash, um, but not all of them. So there's this weird thing happening where people are getting messages saying that their Kraken account is frozen or their withdrawals are frozen, and then they talk to Kraken, and Kraken's like, "Well, no, it's it's not us. That, that that's Gox. Gox says that, but you're fine on our end." And then Gox is like, "No, no, you need to talk to Kraken. You're fine on our end, but but Kraken has a hold on your account." Um, and and uh, there's another thing happening where people are being told, "Oh, the our intermediary for payments for your cash payment in the United States, uh, there was a problem with the intermediary, and there's a problem with your account. You're going to have to come to Japan to get your cash." And so people are like, wait, what? What the hell are you talking about? Like, it's not worth a few thousand dollars for me to fly to Japan and pick up my cash. Probably this will all get resolved, but it's just more of the same. Like with, with the whole Gox thing, it's been a complete fiasco from start to finish. It's been complete fraud by the trustee from start to finish. There, there's just no question here that they are milking this for every scrap of money to extend this thing for as long as they possibly can to bill as many hours as they can. And this is typical. It's happening with F with FTX right now. The FTX is is the same kind of fraud. It's the same kind of bullshit where the lawyers get involved and then they just siphon as much money as they can away from the people who should actually be getting repaid. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's how the legalized theft in our current system works. Um, it's just there's just no getting around it, right? So, um, the so the point about the the Gox update though is that that some people are getting paid Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, which is why I wanted to look at the volume on Monero. Um, because I was thinking, you know, as people get their Bitcoin and their Bitcoin cash, there's a good chance that they're going to sell that um, for some Monero. And since Kraken is the primary exchange that you can register, both register with Gox and buy Monero, I was thinking, hey, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe there's a chance here that that we would see the volume might have ticked up on Kraken. Um, at the same time, I, I don't, we don't really know how many people actually, um, how many people are actually getting paid back. At the moment, right? How many people actually have access to their funds? So um, let's uh, let's maybe take a little bit closer look here. We'll pin that to the new left scale. Then we'll put that on a logarithmic. Okay, so this is the volume, obviously. Uh, yeah, I would say. I mean, we're we have seen the volume tick up ever since the the delisting in February. So on Kraken, the volume is ticked up, and it seems like it stayed relatively high. Um, although, let's take a look at the uh, moving average of the volume because. Obviously, volume candles themselves can be a little bit difficult to keep track of. Um, yeah, so I mean, volume ticked up here. It stayed high, but it is kind of slowly dropping um, over the course of the past, say, six to nine months here. 
Um, I guess that would actually be maybe seven months. Okay. Anyways, uh, what is it? August. So that would be eight, <laughs> eight months. Anyways. Um, uh, yeah, volume may be ticked up ever so slightly here um, as as the Gox coins were getting paid back, but it's that's difficult to say that that would be the people receiving their Gox coins and buying Monero. Um, again, because we don't exactly have the numbers on how many people actually have access to their funds. Um, we do know that the Gox trustee wallet has gone from like two hundred or sorry, one hundred and forty thousand Bitcoin down to like thirty thousand now. So they have transferred these coins to the exchanges at the very least. Um, I'm sure that people will eventually get all that stuff worked out. Like there's all these deadlines and people are freaking out. Like if you go to the Reddit, uh, the Mt. Gox insolvency Reddit, you see people freaking out. Like I'm getting these messages and I'm contacting Kraken and they're not responding and Gox isn't responding. And, and they say I have until this date and it's, you know, who knows. Right. But there's only so like the, the fraud that these lawyers can do can only go so far. Right. And they know it. So like they'll, They'll go right up to that edge, and then they'll they'll clear everything. They'll fix everything um, for the most part, <laughs> probably, probably. Um, okay, yeah. So, anyways, that, that's that's what's going on there with the Gox coin. We also had the U.S. government transferred ten thousand Bitcoin, um, Ross's Bitcoin. Um, they transferred it to Coinbase, so they they stole it from Ross, um, and now Coinbase is going to cash the U.S. Not, the, the United States government out uh, from from that Bitcoin. So. Um, I don't know if they sold that already or if that, I mean, it seems like, why wouldn't you immediately sell it? Why would you transfer it and then wait to sell it? So, um, yeah, I mean, there, there are some kind of like negative headwinds on the Bitcoin price in the near term, but people getting paid back this Gox coin, that's like, ultimately that's, that's a bullish thing. Not necessarily right now, but people getting paid back and getting this whole stupid Gox thing cleared. That's, that's a big deal, right? That's a big deal long-term for price. Um, so you know, it, it kind of lines up actually with the four-year cycle in a way that if this gets cleared before the next crisis happens, before the next um, uh, demand-destroying event, the next tail risk event happens, um, that gets cleared and they do a liquidity expansion, right? That's just one less thing that could weigh on the price. Um, also, I guess, you know, it depends on on what happens with the current 200,000 Bitcoin that are held by the U.S. government. If, um, <laughs> you know, it seems to me that if they were confident that that uh, Kamala was going to be the next president. It, why would they start selling off that Bitcoin immediately? Um, I, I don't know. Like that's that's actually I, I, that's very speculative. I I'm not even sure I believe that. It's just an idea that popped in my head right now. Um, okay, but anyways, like it just so it depends maybe on the elections. It depends on whether or not the winner of the election follows through with what they say they're going to do. Probably they will. Actually, I actually think that if Trump is elected, he probably will. Did he say that? I know that that Kennedy said that that he's going to keep all the Bitcoin and transfer it to the Treasury as a strategic reserve. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny. Um, all of the maximalists, so maybe not too many charts today. All of, like so many maximalists are out there complaining, like, "Oh God, Biden's selling off the Bitcoin. It's it's so wrong, and they're just trying to hurt Bitcoin." It's like, listen, the government always sells off every asset that they seize. Like if they seize cash. They transfer it to the treasury and then they buy stuff with it, like military stuff <laughs> or pensions or whatever, right? If they seize Litecoin, they sell off their Litecoin. If, if they say that they don't sell off their Monero, that was a publication from like four years ago. But like every time the government seizes something, they either use it to buy stuff with or they sell it off. So it's like, stop complaining. The government has held this stupid Bitcoin for like years now. And so, the, yeah, yeah, okay, they're selling it off, whatever. Like, quit complaining about the government not pumping your bags, you, you non. <laughs> you non-anarchist, non-cypherpunk crybabies. Anyways, the Monero right. just gets funneled into the CIA as part of their black budget. <laughs> Bro, you know it, like 100%. So, um, yeah, okay, so that's kind of like the backdrop here of what's happening with um, in the political realm of of, uh, of Bitcoin and selling Bitcoin and, and the lawyers and Gox and all that. But uh, here's the straight here's the straight chart that we're looking at. Uh, obviously, you can see that, you know, so we had the, uh, what are we on, the daily? Yeah, so you can see that um, you know we had the 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 scare. Everyone everyone thought this was the big one. I told you guys it wasn't. Um, we've had some bounce back here, and things are just kind of trending sideways. Uh, it's interesting because um, the the stock market actually did bounce back in in a big way so far. So the stock market has bounced back thirteen percent now off that bottom. Like I said, this was at the time of this low. That was just an ordinary pullback. It was not like it didn't look like the big one at the moment, um, and it was probably just a good buying opportunity. So. Um, say again was it an institutional fake out 
Yeah, I, I would, I would, you could call it that because it was a pretty big drop. Like it, it definitely was. So that was 17%. Um, yeah, that was a 17% drop, which in the current environment really isn't, isn't so crazy. Um, even for the past decade, like usually what we see are like 10 to 15% drops. So 17 was, was a little bit excessive. Um, but, but the rest of the signs just weren't quite lining up yet. Um, you know, like the bond market wasn't quite lining up. Um, just, just everything we look at, it wasn't quite there yet. So it just, it was hard for me to believe that that was actually the big one. Um, you can also see that the S and P 500, um, came back. In fact, the S and P 500 has gotten almost all the way back to the top. It's only, it's, it's within 2% of, of its all time high. So, um, yeah, I mean, like we talk about these purple lines here, charts really love, especially the, sorry, the stock market particularly loves to just oscillate in these, in these purple lines and go up over long periods of time. Um, it was actually a stock market that sort of like propelled my thinking um, to find a way um, to to play with standard deviations to to actually create these purple lines, um, and, and they've been very useful for me. So yeah, anyways, um, I mean things things still on a macro sense are are looking okay. I'm actually a bit surprised to see just a slight bit of comeback here on the reverse repos where they sort of dipped down and they they've come back up a little bit. I guess we could say. Reverse repos received an extra, um, oh, what would that be? Uh, 40 billion, uh, 50 billion. Uh, they, they received an extra 50 billion after dropping. So I, I think that they basically drew from the reverse repos here to save the markets from that crash. Um, you know, because in the lead up to the big one, like you're going to get these kind of like scares. You're going to get these like little, you know, the algos are going to flip, the algos are going to trigger things. You know, you could get these big sell off events um, that could happen, uh, you know, in a moment. Um, and sometimes they just happen randomly for, I don't want to say for no reason, cause it's hard to believe that there's nothing nefarious going on in the background, but who knows, right? Like code does have bugs in it. You know, like there's companies that have lost half a billion dollars in a day because of a coding error, um, in their, in their high frequency trading algorithms. I can't, I can't remember which, um, which company that was but anyways. Um, but yeah, so like the macro is still looking okay. Um, oh, we had some inflation numbers. Oh, uh, we had some inflation numbers this week. So um, we had actually talked about last week. We said, listen, there's inflation numbers coming up. Um, we're still kind of in the recovery phase after this big, this big crash here, this big scare. Um, but that the Federal Reserve said that they're looking to lower rates later this year, um, maybe as soon as September. They didn't say September. Um, they, they, they're trying not to give the Ford guidance of rate of lowering rates, but they really are talking about like the conditions under which it's appropriate and how that time is approaching. The point was that if the inflation numbers dropped again, which they did, so this was the last inflation numbers here at this, uh, this vertical bar. Um, hmm, that's odd. Got a there we go. Sorry about chats. that. I'll go ahead and read out. Please. Uh, we got one from Materialist Tipped, 33 cents. Long live the discrete logarithm problem for the twisted Edwards elliptic curve, ED25519. And we got one elliptic curve. That's funny. That is funny. Tipped $2.51. I would like body to cover the gold Friday close price. 2519.82 up 57.77. Is it breaking out? Yeah, gold did hit an all-time menu all-time high this week. Yeah, absolutely, bro. We will cover gold here in a very short moment. We always cover gold. I uh, I love gold. Um call me Scrooge McDuck. Okay, so we've got, we've got the inflation numbers here. And um, yeah, so that vertical line right there is, was the last numbers. And then obviously, this is the next numbers. One thing that's important here um, that, that was kind of a big deal in my mind was the white. So the, the white line is the core inflation. And that's kind of the one that the Fed really pays a little bit more attention to. The CPI is in... Um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Let me rephrase this. Uh, the CPI is in, uh, in white. And then the core inflation is in orange. So you'll notice the core inflation is ever so slightly higher than the CPI. But one thing that happened here with the CPI is that you'll notice here in 2023, right? In June of 2023, um, we hit 3% on the CPI at this reading. And then ever since then, we've kind of been like bouncing up and down there. And then finally, we actually had a lower reading in um, for, for, this, for this recent uh, uh, numbers that we got this past week. And you'll see that the, the core inflation has been continuously following, uh, falling. What this means is that the market is looking at this. The market says, ah, we have good inflation numbers. The CPI is now below 3%, which is, which is a really good sign. And the Fed is, that means the Fed is more likely to lower rates because it means they've got inflation under control. Um, so that being the case, you would expect to see the market bounce on that news, which is basically what happened on Wednesday morning. Um, so 
um, or at least over like the course of the rest of the week. So um, yeah, the inflation numbers here, that was a good, that was a good like way to trade the market. If you look at that kind of thing, if you're, if you pay attention to that kind of thing. So um, yeah, this, this signals that we're going to get a, a rate lowering this year, which also signals to us the beginning of the, like the, the, the snowball into the, into the tail risk event, right? Because what's going to happen is this is going to stair step down. The, the white line um, is going to stair step down over a period of time. And then we're going to see the yield curve start to normalize. And then we're going to see bonds start to drop. And at some point, there's going to be a violent crash. Um, there's going to be violent moves in the bond market. And that's going to be our signal that we are in the short hairs. We are very, very close. Um, but we're not there yet. So, um, yep, that's that's kind of what the macro looks like there. Still steady state. Again, like I've told you guys for months and months and really going on more than a year now, um, this whole bond market thing moves so slowly. And it's going to be boring for a long period of time. And it's going to like a slow motion train wreck. Until one moment, it's going to move violently, and then it's going to be—it could be days or weeks at best um, to to make your moves. Um, okay, so let's take a look here at the gold price because yeah, gold did close at an all-time high. Um, we're basically still in this channel. So, um, oh, I forgot the name of our super chatter, um, but yeah, thanks for thanks for pointing us towards gold because you know gold is another one of those really big important assets. You should hold it in your portfolio. Like, okay, if I was trying to turn $20,000 into my retirement, um, maybe I wouldn't hold that much gold. Um, I'd probably be in crypto. Um, I'd probably be in, in volatile, high-risk, high-reward assets. Um, but gold is a great way if you have, you know, if you're, if you're in the six figures range, you, I tend to think you should be holding gold um, because you need to start playing a little bit of safety once you, once you get to higher and higher levels. And gold, in long, over long periods of time, keeps up with inflation. It just does. Um, even though it can lag, right? It, it does it in starts and fit, fits. Gold can be lagging for a long time and then it can make a big breakout, but overall it tends to keep up with inflation. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, so we're basically in this, uh, oops, we're, we're basically in this, this zone right here where we've got, uh, you know, this like rising wedge kind of rising, a rising, um, pattern here. These things in a bullish market, rising patterns can break out to the upside, right? So this thing could break out and then, and then make its way up higher. Um, is it going to do it today? I don't know. I don't, I don't really have any big um, opinions on whether or not it does that in the next week or the next month. Um, you know, we, we do have kind of this very, uh, let's go to the monthly here. And actually, you know, I turned on the wave magic, but we're going to turn that off. So there, I mean, there's always like these obvious places to look for, um, for resistance. And this would be one of them, right? This is, so we're on the monthly candles. Now, if you take a look down here at the bottom, you can see that this is set by just two points. So the 1980 blow off that happened after after the decade long run in gold because uh, of Nixon severing the gold standard, and then the 2011 blow off that happened um, because gold had been so depressed for like all of this time after that blow off top in in 1980. So what we do is we just connect those two lines, and I mean, you know, again, this is pleb line stuff, guys, but. Um, a lot of people look at this, and this is such an obvious way to draw the chart that you have to think that that line means something, right? That line does mean something. So that would kind of be a place that you might look for strong resistance. So if we were to break the short term, uh, if we were to break the short term pattern right here to the upside, I honestly wouldn't expect it to go too much farther than this 2600 level. Um, that would actually be so hypothetically, we break this, kind of do that, and then we jump up here. Maybe even you get a wick up there for a moment, right? I would be looking at this area right here as a moment to take profits, as a moment to, I don't know, maybe buy a house, buy some land, right? I would I would want to make a long-term play at that moment to transfer into some other kind of asset. Um, now, at the same time, so we could be looking at a situation where new liquidity expansion is going to happen. I say we could. I actually think that it's extremely likely that Trump, the next president, will be handed some kind of crisis, um, probably a cyber crisis. For which they will blame the next the the next um, tail risk event, the next market crash, like the real market crash, the next big real market crash. They're going to blame that on some probably a cyber event. Maybe it's something else that we haven't thought of. I don't know. Maybe it'll be monkeypox for all we know. Um, but it'll probably be a cyber event, and that's going to be a market crash. They're going to blame the market crash on the cyber event and say, "Oh, we don't have a choice. Our hands are tied. We've got to expand the liquidity. Um, we've got to lower rates. We've got to we've got to restart um, the, uh, the asset purchasing by the Federal Reserve." Um, and, and that's going to be that, right? They're going to expand all that. So if that happens, you would expect that gold would perform early on, right? Like, which means that gold might actually break this line. That that's so that's kind of another point that I'm trying to make. So this line, this big line here that we looked at on the monthly, 
that line is very likely probably going to be significant resistance for a moment, um, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be resistance forever. You can also see that there is like, it's a rising wedge, right? And the simple fact is that this asset gold is going up like for as long as they're going to print money, <laughs> print US dollars. Gold is going to keep rising relative to the US dollar over long periods of time. And you can see that this long-term rising wedge is coming to a point here. Um, I guess it's like 2030, which is only six years away. But you can see that it's coming to a head here at some point. And this chart is going to bump up against this line, find resistance at some point, consolidate, and then break out to the upside. Now, that could still be two, three years from now. That It very well could be. For all we know, it could, it could be within the next year. Um, but the point is that this is a pattern that is meant to be broken. This rising wedge will get broken at some point to the upside, um, which will probably signal some very large macro bull market in gold. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's you know that's that's kind of like the short and long term game there on gold. Right now, in in terms of the pattern, you you would expect a little bit of resistance at this current level right here. Um, but again, rising resistance in a bullish scenario, rising resistance gets broken to the upside. So it is possible, right? It, it could get it could get broken at any moment. I personally am not selling. I'm not taking any profits here um, at the top of this line. You know, I got my fingers crossed that this thing's going to pump to the upside. I'm also a little bit. I feel slightly overexposed to cash. Um, you know, because it, it's it's like it's one of those things where it's like if you can make plays here and and limit the amount of money you have to put at risk and then get outsized gains, it's like well, okay, I don't necessarily like it's not a big deal to have a lot of cash because you're going to get these like pointed wins here and there and all you need is like one or two of them a year um or even one or two of them every few years um can get you there um and then the other thing is that okay i am expecting a tail risk event at some point so you know i do want to have a lot of cash on hand to just scoop up just buy the market whenever that happens so um anyways yeah but uh, since i i do feel maybe a little bit overexposed to cash i do want to i do want to hang on to my gold i do want to hang on to the assets that i have um because you know i don't want to get totally left behind in case we don't get some kind of um you know big market crash so um, yeah, that's that's why we're looking here at gold. Um, let's even go. We could drop down to even shorter, even shorter time frame here at the eight hour. Um, one thing that I would say is that, I mean, that does look good, man. Like on the short term, that that's a good wave magic pattern right here. So let's zoom in a little bit more. You can see that uh, effectively gold came up, like it set some kind of uh, highs there, consolidated in in between the um, uh, the the standard deviations, the Bollinger bands as some people call them. And then it just found its way oscillating up now with these blue bands curling towards the upside, right? So that basically provides a level of support to keep this chart going up. Um, and because of that, it, it basically sets the chart up in a way that it could actually break out at any time, right? Like for all we know, Monday, gold just takes off to the upside, breaks this rising resistance, and then heads off to 2600, 2650. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the way I'd be thinking about gold right there. That's, that's my, my uh, long form thoughts on gold. Um, let's take a look at Bitcoin relative to the NASDAQ. Um, so Bitcoin relative to the NASDAQ is, uh, is currently being flat, still hasn't recovered its all time highs, um, from, from 2021, uh, which is, you know, that's kind of to be expected. It's actually currently uh, on a, on a longer sense, Bitcoin relative to the NASDAQ relative to tech stocks is currently sitting at its all time high from, from 2017, which, which is very interesting, right? Like, um, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is like, if you were at the top of the bull market in, uh, in 2017 to have just dropped your entire Bitcoin gains into the NASDAQ, you would have had basically the same returns over the past, Jesus, what is that, seven years? Over the past seven years, you'd have the same returns. And, and you'd have it in a more stable sense, actually, because the NASDAQ doesn't, um, doesn't crash as much. So you'd, have, you'd actually have probably better risk-adjusted returns. Um, not that I'm trying to show the NASDAQ to you guys or anything, but I'm just telling you, you know, I'm just telling you what the relative performance here of Bitcoin to the NASDAQ is. And the risk adjusted returns in the NASDAQ um, have been better than Bitcoin for the past seven years. Um, so keep that in mind, right? When people try to try to shill to you, when, when people are the maximalists are out there shilling how amazing, perfect, blow your socks off <laughs> Bitcoin is as, as the number go up. It's like, okay, yeah, but but the NASDAQ has also performed quite well. So, you know, you're not. You're not that unique, guys, but okay, whatever. I think I thoroughly trash talked the maximalist enough for, for one episode. Uh, Monero notes still hanging out around 12,000. And uh, guys, I don't know what's happening here, but I'm a little bit disappointed in all of you. Why are the Monero transactions dip below 20,000 here this week? <sighs> Shake my head. I, I, I was trying to do my Monero transactions. I don't know what the rest of you guys are up to, but get it together, y'all. Get it together. Okay. <laughs> I'm just playing, obviously. Uh, with that, I, I think. 
Sicily, man. Not using my Monero. <laughs> Sicily, I gotta gotta get back to uh, New okay. York. I didn't realize you accounted for like that much percent of our total daily transactions. Damn, bro. I guess it makes sense. I mean, you got to. You're gonna be like you're gonna be a significant portion of Monero transactions. Probably already getting there with uh, with XMR Bazaar. Yeah, that would be the day. That's the goal. But yeah, why why are transactions so low, guys? Come on. We 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 got reasons to use it right now. That is odd, right? What, can, what, what do you think that's all about? Just the the doldrums of uh, of the seasons here. I mean, uh, what, what's yeah, it's just it? variability. I don't, I'm not I'm not really. You know, I'm I'm not too concerned about it, but yeah, I mean, we had been centering around twenty five thousand, and then this past week things dropped down by, um, I don't know, I guess we could call it, we could say average of twenty two and a half, so we dropped just a little bit, um, pro probably just regular random variability. Okay, when was the last time we were this low? Back in mm. like June. No, I guess that would be February. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, the last time we saw transactions dip as low as they did. So they dipped dip down to 19,145 um, on August 10th. And the last time it was that low would have been February 17th or February 18th at 18,000 transactions. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. Well, that's it for today. Hopefully, um, oh, you know what? Let's check the YouTube comments, make sure that we didn't we didn't miss anything. Yeah, we don't get right. any questions. For all we know, the next terrorist event could be a fake alien invasion. <laughs> uh, it's possible. I, that's perhaps it's perhaps it could be done. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure that I would be on that one. I, I feel like the the fake alien invasion is so outlandish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're like they'll save that for the very last. Like that's the last thing they'll do. They'll use everything else they can before that moment. Has that been heating like up last again? Is that, is that, like, I have not been following the uh, No, I haven't the seen mainstream. anything. Okay. Really yeah, I guess aliens aren't in vogue these days. I mean, you know, six months ago. I thought I did see something. Um, Buddy, what do you think, man? So what, what would be better? I know I heard your comments with regards to Trump and Bitcoin and him, you know, buying up all the Bitcoin. What do you think would be better for Monero? A Trump win or a Kamala Harris win? Or not, you know, um, be a large effect on either. Obviously, there's a lot of angles that you could go, and and the way you want to analyze it. Um, personally, I think that I hate to say this, I hate to be so damn honest. Trump, a Trump win is probably better for all of us in every regard. I think he probably actually will be relatively friendly to crypto. Um, that that doesn't mean that I think like he's always telling the truth about everything. I just think that in this one instance. He will probably free Ross. He will probably be more friendly to crypto. He will probably not sell off all the Bitcoin, right? He'll probably like keep that as a stash or whatever st strategic reserve. Um, and it was under his administration that the office of the comptroller of the currency said that um, even anonymity enhanced coins are legal for banking purposes, right? They they released this memo to um, to all the banks saying that it's our opinion that that uh, that all cryptocurrencies all really. Uh, independently verifiable node networks, <laughs> blockchains kind of, um, are legal for banking purposes, even ones with anonymity enhanced um, uh, anonymity enhancements, and that we trust that you guys already have the tools to deal with cash, and so you can you you have the ability to deal with um, with anonymity crypto. That oh, was under his administration. Oh, was that like was only years ago. Yeah, it, it was years ago. But it was under his administration. So, I mean, you know, and then plus, he's got all this money. He's one of these rich guys. You know, he probably, as far as the IRS goes, he'll probably like, you know, chill them out a little bit. Right. Uh, I just think overall, like, yeah, probably I, I don't, I don't like, I, I'm worried about whatever emergency thing is coming and whatever emergency powers they're going to exercise. Um, so, like, on the surface of it, that's what it looks like to me. But, you know, Trump was, was freaking horrible. Horrible for medical freedom. Horrible for being able to move, to travel, to leave your house. Like he, lo like it wasn't just airports. He locked down all federal facilities. He locked down U.S. parks. He forced you to wear masks in all federal facilities. He prevented foreigners from entering the country. He got the, he laid out the groundwork for the warp speed vaccine so that Biden he could tag team Biden like WWE WrestleMania 
he could tag him in and then they could try and force that backs on everyone. Like Trump was positively horrible. Like he was, he was great for, for crypto kind of, um, and some of the stuff they did with the administration, but like, I don't know. It's, I just hate, <laughs> like, I, I can't see necessarily what they're going to do in terms of emergency measures in the next crisis and how that's going to affect us overall on the surface of things. I would say, all right, Trump's probably better for crypto than, um, and Monero than, than Kamala. But, you know, who, who knows, like in the broader context, maybe not, maybe if Kamala wins because they steal the election, everyone's like, holy crap, we have to disobey. Everybody start using crypto. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hell yeah. Get into Monero. So the government can't see. like, it could actually be the case that Kamala would be better, like not right. in a legal sense, but just in a, in a social sense. Yeah. 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 I'm thinking that too. The, the, the JD Vance thing is interesting too, with the connection to, uh, Peter Thiel and Palantir. I think we talked about that on yeah. the show. But they seem to be yeah. in the business of wanting to be able to completely surveil society. And so I don't know how Monero, you know, how, how they'll respond or deal with Monero. Uh, I never really heard Peter Thiel's take on Monero. I've heard him criticize Bitcoin for not being private. So I don't know. I'm confused by him. Have you have you like looked into him closely, Peter Thiel? Because I mean, he's literally um, in the business of providing the U.S. government surveillance technology. Like, yeah, virus. I haven't looked into him closely. I just know that he's associated with that entire cabal. He seems to be a little bit more on the corporate end of it, you know, where it's like it's hard to say like how much infighting there is in the deep state and the Illuminati, whatever. He seems to be sort of on the corporate side of the Illuminati, whereas. You know, other other people are more on like the communist government side, but I mean, yeah, he's like he's deep in every like in all of that stuff, uh, and yeah, so JD Vance is totally associated with him, and um, yeah, who knows, man, who knows what uh, what schemes they're cooking up.